this is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. The gun control debate in America goes on and on. But for Lachey Johnson, it ended October 1st, 2017, between the hours of 10.05 and 10.15 p.m., when a gunman fired more than a 1,000 rounds of ammo from his Mandalay Bay Hotel suite in Las Vegas into a crowd of people at a concert. He killed 60 people and wounded over 400, including Lachey. She describes what happened to her that night and what life is like now in her book, why not me? October 1. I was a director of catering and events, working the VIP area, and I see Jason Aldean. The laser show was going on. It's all this buildup because he's the last act. So then I see one or two guys with like blood on them, and I'm thinking, well, maybe they just fell. You know, one and one didn't add up to two at this point. And I'm like, hmm. So then when the laser show stops, the music stops, and it's like, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Jason Aldean. It's about 12 minutes after 10. And all you heard was, da 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 We were just being sprayed, literally. Everybody's falling, running falling down the uh you're just kind of running for your life and trying to take cover and then maybe five minutes later it's another and people are like these are gunshots run and diving on top of people it was just i i can't explain it just horrific just horrific i i i froze because i'm like this can't be happening and by me freezing there's uh, if you, if the layout, if you will, is like gun victim one, two, and then there's a three and a four. I was right between the two and the three. Um, I was at the stage. I was barricaded in, and a lady had got shot in her neck, and I was trying to pull her over the barricade. So I've been through therapy on that because I could not open up the barricade for some reason. So I'm trying to pull her over while she's holding her fingers in her neck. So I was glazed on my shoulder and we fell back and someone stepped on my ankle and crushed the ankle and tore all the ligaments. So I am now with a cane permanently. Then I'm injured. I'm hiding under the bleachers for about an hour, an hour and a half. And I'm playing dead. I'm literally just playing dead. I'm scared to move. And they're saying, this is when SWAT and everybody's coming. Is anybody up underneath the bleachers? I didn't move. I didn't say a word because I didn't know who they were. I thought it was still the shooters because you don't know where it's coming from. I just lay there and played that. Literally the first nine months in my home, I slept with all the lights on. And then still as of today, it's this, you feel like, so you're still going to get shot. Like it's not over. Any noise you hear, you jump. Obviously I have severe PTSD. I haven't worked since the shooting. I had just started working in January, but I had to find another career. I have gone to the crime scene once since this happened. I can't even look at Mandalay Bay. And I'm still in therapy once a week. I used to be in therapy every single day. So is this book part of your therapy? Yes, the book is a therapy because I could not talk to anybody about what had happened. So the book was just like my pain. Like, why isn't my church here? Why isn't my friends here? I am injured and I live in a two-story house. I cannot bathe myself. I cannot lift my arm. And I'm three surgeries in, <laughs> three surgeries in and needing home health care. And I'm thinking, I am still washing up in my kitchen sink. And I had to do Uber because I couldn't drive. It's my right foot. I was doing Uber for one year for the mental therapy, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then physical therapy, Tuesday and Thursday. I did not want to live because I knew I didn't have any help. So that's why the book is titled, Why Not Me? Why didn't you take me? What do you want me to do? Knowing my past and knowing my history, being a single mom with two kids, this is too much. 
if I don't work, I don't eat. How am I going to make it? And my employer was still doing gun shows. NRA is big in Las Vegas. And I'm thinking, holy sh! I don't want to walk back into a casino and we're doing a gun show. I'm petrified. So all I could do was write that I'm angry. I'm hating the world. I'm hating people. Never thought this was going to be a book. But then when I started talking about survivors, you know, talking to my other survivor and my friends and coworkers, they were like, Shay, just publish it because everything you say in here is what we're feeling and people don't get it. Did you send a copy to the NRA? I did not. I'm hoping my book will tell you what to do, teach you how to breathe. Don't depend on your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Go get help. Therapy is okay. It is the best because it's almost like an escrow. Someone, the middleman that don't take sides. You have to tell your story because it's not going to go away. By writing the book, I was saying the bottom line is when I say my friends and my family and my church wasn't there for me, they weren't there because they didn't know how to be there. So, but what nobody can imagine. So they want to downplay it and act as though it didn't happen and just want you to get better. But it takes time. So in my book, I say, let time be time. The body is taking the score. This is uh, one powerful story, Lachey. Thank you so much for sharing it. And I, I hope you get better every single day. It was 50 years ago on May 25th, 1961, that JFK gave an historic speech before Congress calling for an ambitious space exploration program. And here we are, still debating his murder. James Chipman prepared a statement for his book entitled The Murder Trial of JFK, a topic he studied for decades. Hello, I'm James O. Chipman. I have a master's degree in history. I've been an archivist at the Colorado State Archives for the last 28 years. I've been researching the Kennedy assassination for over 50 years. I've just written a book titled The Murder Trial of JFK. This book is what you have been waiting to read for 58 years. Of course, if it came out in 1963, I would have been murdered and all my research notes destroyed, which is what happened to What's My Line panelist and journalist Dorothy Kell Gallon. Listen to the witnesses who were not allowed to testify in 1963 or had their testimony changed by the FBI, and then make your verdict. Abraham Bolden was a Secret Service agent, and he testified that that on November 2nd, 1963, they tried to kill Kennedy in Chicago, then again on November 18th in Tampa, Florida, and finally in Dallas, where the assassins used Secret Service ID. Ed Hoffman was at Dealey Plaza 45 minutes before JFK got there. He saw a gunman take a shot at Kennedy from the grassy you knoll behind the fence, and handed the rifle to his partner, who broke it down and placed it in a case. Gordon Arnold was just out of boot camp in the Army and was still in his uniform. A Secret Service imposter showed him his ID and told him he was not allowed to stay there on the grassy you knoll. Just then, a bullet was fired from a rifle behind him and went right past his left ear. He instinctively hit the deck. His camera was confiscated and never returned. Hoover and the FBI decided in less than two days that Oswald was the killer and ignored all the other witnesses that said otherwise. He had spent the last 30 years building up the reputation at the FBI and operated it with the directive of do not embarrass the FBI. He had to have a quick conviction with an open and shut case. What do you suppose America and the world would have thought if it was revealed after an extensive investigation of the Kennedy assassination that the FBI had Oswald under surveillance before JFK was killed, and that both Oswald and Ruby were paid informers for the FBI. It would have also shown that the FBI was using wiretaps and illegal break-ins in many of its investigations. You have to ask yourself three questions. Why was Kennedy killed? Who benefited? Who had the power to cover it up? Lyndon B. Johnson, Kennedy's vice president, was going to be dropped from the ticket in 1964. He was going to go to jail because of his scandals with Bobby Baker and Billy Solessis, which were being revealed by Bobby Kennedy in an expose in Live magazine the week after Kennedy was killed. LBJ opted instead of going to jail and being actually disgraced to becoming president of the United States. 
It was a coup d'etat. After almost 60 years, it's time for the world to know the truth behind the death of JFK. If Kennedy had won re-election in 1964, there would not have been an American Vietnam War. You will learn things about Lyndon B. Johnson that you would not believe were possible. John F. Kennedy's assassination started a deep distrust that Americans have with their government that continues to this day. A major part of this distrust happened because the government lied to us about the assassination and lied to us about the Vietnam War. This book will tell you what really happened on November 22nd. 1960. Okay. Well, I hope you get to talk about it. I would love to see you debate some of the uh, people who have researched this. It'd be nice to have you all on one stage. Yeah. Well, it'd be an excellent follow-up to uh, Oliver Stone's movie, uh, JFK, came out in 1992, or making a, a documentary of it as well. That would work out quite well. And, and each reader is a member of the jury, and they, they listen to the testimony of these witnesses, and then make their verdict. You know, like Dorothy Kell Gallon. She was uh, uh, the, the, the leading female journalist in the country at that time. She was also pa a panelist on What's My Line. And then after Kennedy was killed, she went down to Dallas and interviewed Jack Ruby. And then she was all elated and all excited. She came back and she says, um, I'm going to blow the lid off the Kennedy assassination, and this will be the, the, the story of the century. And uh, two weeks later, she's found dead in her apartment, fully clothed, in a bedroom she never slept in, with a book she had read uh, eight months before. Her friend, who she had confided with, is also found dead, and her research notes are never found. Uh, there's all, all, almost 50 witnesses like that, key witnesses, who are mysteriously killed before they could testify. I don't know. It's one of those stories you wonder if you'll ever know the truth. Thanks, James. When Pastor Ed Stark saw a group of protesters in Las Vegas demanding a livable minimum wage, he was inspired to write The Myth, The Lie, and The True Facts About Minimum Wage. It's interesting that people, they ask for certain things without knowing the history of what they're asking for. So I came home, I kept thinking about it, and me being a pastor, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, said to gather the facts and write about it. And so that's what I did. When I got out the Marine Corps in 1974, a minimum wage was $2 an hour. And I was applying for jobs and stuff, and I had just gotten married, and uh, we were expecting our first child, and it was uh, pretty hard back then. I remember getting a job for $3 an hour, and I thought that I had won the Olympic gold medal because I was a dollar ahead of minimum wage, but then I ended up losing that job, and going back down to minimum wage. And then June 1st, all of a sudden, my wages went from $2 an hour to $2.21. It wasn't much, but it was better than $2. And then January 1st came, and it went up to $2.42. And I said, wow, well, I'm, I started low, but at least I'm climbing the ladder. And it continued to happen until when President Reagan got in office, one of his first uh, executive orders was he wanted to freeze minimum wage. And in the six years after I had gotten out of the Marine Corps, minimum wage had rose from $2 an hour to $4.50 an hour. And then President Reagan froze it, and his ex reasoning was that it was going to hurt the small businessman. And I don't know, as I say in the book, whether he was really being uh, truthful uh, if he had been misdirected or misled or he was just being untruthful because it didn't help just small businessmen. It helped all businessmen uh, because minimum wage is the baseline for employment in America, and you can't, you can't go lower. You can only go higher. And as a result of that, for those 30-something years that minimum wage has never been revived because when you say you're freezing something, we freeze it for a while and then we thaw it out. That's never happened in the case of minimum wage. And that's why I thought it was important to write the book so that people would see what minimum wage really should be. And then if they're going to aspire to have minimum wage raised, have it raised not just uh, what sounds good or what's politically correct, but to a livable minimum wage because but where minimum wage has remained low, all the other prices for everything have continued to grow. And if they grow, 
then how is the person on the bottom going to ever seek to achieve the American dream? And the American dream is home ownership. My contention is whether they get a, a, a Ph.D. degree or just a high school diploma, a dropout, shouldn't they have the opportunity as Americans to at least have the American dream of home ownership? And for most people in America, that's what it is. It's not a yacht. It's not a, a jet plane. It's just being able to purchase a home and be able to provide security for their family. If the minimum wage had kept going up gradually as the economy and everything else went up, then we wouldn't be faced with a problem now where to increase the minimum wage, it's going to be huge. Exactly. And what I believe should happen, a constitutional amendment for a, a livable minimum wage, because when you think about the preamble to the Constitution, promote the general welfare, uh, people have a problem with raising minimum wage, but they don't understand people who receive minimum wage and a livable minimum wage, they're not going to become multimillionaires, but they will be able to provide for their families. And the crisis can be avoided in raising minimum wage if they do it gradually and, and put back in place where you got to accelerate it to a certain point but then put it put back in place the same mechanisms that used to exist, and that was the wage adjustment increase June 1st and the cost of living increase January 1st. And if they did that, everyone would be able to adjust to that. Well, it seems to me the sooner we take care of this, the better off we're all going to be, but let's see if that happens. All right, we got to take a quick break, but we're coming right back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Michael Jowers keeps America moving with his own trucking company, but writing is what helped him channel the stress and all the emotions he was dealing with when he was deployed to Afghanistan with the Army a few years back. The end result? From the shadows they fall. Isabella Gooden, who's from Chicago, grew up in a fluent family pageants, what have you. Uh, Liam Johansson, on the other hand, his character was drawn somewhat from life experience and that you serve your country, you do the best you can, but sometimes life just deals you a tough hand. And as both the characters experience, when that happens, you can withdraw, become somewhat of a recluse. And that's actually where the title of the book comes from. Is, and they, they both decided to live in the shadows and just hide and have as little interaction as possible. But then through the encouragement of other people and then meeting each other, they somewhat pull each other out of that. So life is, a, is an amazing thing. Um, she is actually moving on or trying to move on. And she decides to move on from an abusive husband. So she takes a trip uh, to Florida, and but on the way, uh, she experiences some bad weather, and she winds up crashing into a ditch on Liam's property, and he actually he rescues her from that storm, and basically just by being around each other and getting to know each other, they start being more open, and they start relying on one another. And, of course, listening to family and some friends and what have you to kind of push them to get out of where they are. And, again, I think that relates to a lot of people. I think we've all been through our own school of hard knocks. 
And sometimes it takes that encouragement uh, from other people to get us back on track. Where do we go from here with this book? Are you able to talk about it? Are you able to promote it at all? Yes, actually, I'm encouraged by what has happened so far. It has been a slower build, but that's okay. I didn't expect you know New York Times bestseller right off the out of the gate, but I'm scheduled for a couple more radio interviews. A friend of mine is a librarian, and she read it, and she's like, "Hey, I'm really hoping we can put this in the library. People check out." I was like, "Sure." Started advertising the book. I guess they advertise and promote it on uh, different social media like um, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, what have you. And it's local radio stations, different friends and family that have put me in contact with them that uh, want to promote it. My wife and I recently moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, there's a couple of local bookstores, Barnes & Noble, want me to do a, a signing, you know, in-person signing. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. I think it's picking up you know, it's, it's step by step. And again, I'm, I'm enjoying it because I'm learning seeing how this process goes. So, Michael, that's great. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. That's awesome. A lot of people can't figure it out. I'm telling you. Yeah, I tell you, it's, uh, but it's just like anything, you know, a lot, just about anything in life looks easier when you're not doing it. But once you start doing it, it's like, oh, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into this. It's, and it really makes me uh, appreciate and respect people who have done well because you see the work and the dedication and effort that it takes to succeed you know like what would you tell other authors write what you've experienced or write what you enjoy number one because that'll come out in the book if you really enjoy or you're really interested in what you're writing about that'll come out in your words but the second thing is be patient because it takes a while to bring it from manuscript to a book on the shelf. So that'd be my main thing is that uh, be patient. <laughs> it's great, you know, because I guess you see you see something again. It started out as a as a blank sheet of paper, so to speak, um, and now it's a book and it's something you create. And really, you become it's almost like you get to know your characters and you're hoping that other people enjoy them as much as you do. So yeah, it's been, it's been a fun, I said, it's been a really fun learning experience and uh, there's going to be a sequel to this one already because people have asked, you know, what happens to the characters now? Because really my motivation is I enjoyed writing it and I'm going to continue writing and I really just want other people to enjoy reading it. I hope it encourages them to do just like the characters to, to understand that life may do you a tough hand every now and then, but you just got to keep pushing forward. So what's the saying when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. <laughs> All right, Michael, thank you. To say Aiden Wolf is a prolific writer would be an understatement. He has 15 different stories going at the moment and says the ideas are coming so fast he can't write fast enough. Check out his first published book, Crow's Blood, Seven Days. Basically, it's about corruption and the separation between right and wrong legal and illegal, the voids where they fall out of balance, innocent people suffer at the hands of others. It's about exposing the powers behind the scenes that drive the machines that people believe are in control and, and just kind of bringing to light some things that, I mean, a lot of it's really, you know, it's fiction, but it's it correlates very closely to things that have happened and are happening in the world. Devin Sanders would be the main character. He's a retired special forces um, becomes bounty hunter. There are two agents that that get shot. One is killed. The other one's in is in a coma, and they have to hunt down the people that they believe are responsible, which are Native Americans on the reservation in the mountains. And a week of rain takes away all of their normal capabilities, resources. So they have to turn to other means to try to track him down, and that's why. Um, the agent in charge look, turns to his old army buddy because he's the best tracker he knows. And and uh, it kind of unfolds from there. And then things start to reveal themselves as, as the story goes on, as they get into it. You start to realize they're 
they're dealing with a lot more than they realized. Well, it sounds like, you know, they end up on the other side of the law, right? They end up, instead of being the hunters, they're the hunted. Yes, and that's, that. coincidentally, that's the name of the second book. Since it's a lot of action, and this first one really just sets the precedence for the entire story. It's, it's a very, very big story. It's going to be um, anywhere from three to seven, depending on how things go with it and with other stories. But I have so many other stories to come in. Many of them are, are series. There are some that are just single stories, um, one book. You know, it sounds like you've had a lot of writing going on for a lot of years, and suddenly this was the year for you. But this was the first story that I had started, and as as the process went along, I, I kept getting other ideas, and so I had to write them down so I didn't lose them. You know, and some of which, some of them are are written like I have a whole stack of of handwritten books. But nonetheless, uh, what really sparked me to get moving on all this was I heard the story about J.K. Rollins and the success she had despite the hardship that she was dealing with, and I I was dealing with some similar situations in my life, and I thought to myself, well, I can do that. It's that simple. Um. I have a Facebook page, Aiden Wolf, and then I have a LinkedIn page also, Aiden Wolf, and I'm working on a website, and then, of course, I have the author web page through Page Publishing. It will be movies or, or television series or something, I have no doubt. You know somebody? Uh, well, I have a brother-in-law who's an actor, and uh, so, yeah, I kind of have a little bit of an inside track on that. Work. I'm working on it. Oh, man, that would be a lucky break, Aiden. You go for it. All right, what a show. Great authors, great stories, even got some really good advice. If you love what you're writing, good chance we're going to love reading it, but won't know till you try, will we, huh? Beach reading season is coming up, so let's get cracking. We know you're out there. Need a bump? Download the podcast at 710WOR.com. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. I'll catch you next time.